That's fine. Volume? Yeah, volume's good. Um, maybe I'll adjust this just a little bit down. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, please open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. We'll skip around for a few passages, uh, but we'll start here. We won't get to this verse for at least a couple of minutes while we... Uh, so, Pastor asked if I would teach a Sunday school series. And so I said, yeah, what would you like me to uh, teach on? And he goes, uh, how about depression and suicide? Um, identifying and um, using the spirit to overcome feelings of depression. And I was like, well, interesting you ask me that. Um, not going to go into great detail, but this is a subject that is um, pretty close to my heart. I've dealt with, I've battled depression, and I'm pretty sure several of us have at the time. I'm sure I'll pose that question in a little bit. But the, the subject is, is pretty near to me as I've struggled with depression. I've struggled with it not only at times when I, not only when I was not saved, but also at times when I was, when I've been, uh, while I've been a Christian. This has been an area that has been <coughs> a struggle for me. And so I want to, um, so this is certainly an interesting study that we're going to be looking at over the next several weeks. Um, I want to begin by just defining depression. But before I do that, I'm going to make a, uh, the qualifica I'm going to make a qualification. And the qualification is that this study is not intended to study the physical and scientific aspects or causes of depression. Rather, this is going to be a study that is going to look at how to overcome depression, how to identify, okay, at what point are we depressed, at what point does being a little downtrodden turn into full outright depression, how can we identify it, how can we overcome depression? Where can we go in the scripture to turn aside these thoughts and bring back the joy of our salvation? Uh, here's, a, here's a good definition of depression um, written down here. It's a feeling of listlessness, loneliness, fatigue, and despair, coupled with the inability to have purpose or possess hope for a good outcome. The cause of depression can be twofold. It can be physical, meaning there, uh, you could be depressed because of an injury. I know there's people who, who get depressed after with a, uh, with, a, with a physical ailment, whether it's a short-term ailment or a longer-term ailment. It also could be a circumstance. You know, maybe there's something going on in your life that is causing you to get down. Maybe it's psychological. Maybe it's something going on in your head. Maybe it's maybe it's been maybe it's been a uh, a mental impediment that you've had for years. Or it could also be also you could have a spiritual cause of depression, which is a lot more of the aspects we're going to be looking into could also be a realization and frustration of the vanity of life. I know Solomon has gone, Solomon goes at length to talk about, you know, how life actually is, for the most part, the pursuit of life is, is vanity. Um, Webster defines depression in the following terms. Uh, first, the act of pressing down or the state of being pressed down, a low state. A depression, <clears throat> a hollow, a sinking or falling in of a surface, or a forcing inwards, as roughness consisting in little protuberances and depressions, the depression of the skull, the act of humbling, abasement, as a depression of pride, depression of the nobility, a, 
um, a state of sadness, want of uh, courage or animation as depression of the mind, a low state of strength, a low state of business or of property. So there's several definitions there that uh, certainly would apply in the study of just, just the word in general. It's a noun, by the way, if you were looking for the... Or if you're one of those people who <laughs> want to know that kind of thing. Uh, some terms that we use in conjunction with the idea of depression are lonely, fearful, tired, sad, hopeless, anxious, fatigued, the feeling of being useless, worthless, uh, sometimes you're lethargic, uh, you tend to carry negative, those who are depressed will be negative, woe is me, that kind of attitude. Now what I want to do here is, this morning, I want us to realize, before we kind of go, before we go into a lot of character studies regarding depression, those who battled with it in scripture, and those accounts are written for our examples. Before we go into that, that will be starting next week, what I want to do this week is I want to look at two major lies of depression. I want us to see that God has a plan for your life, God has a plan for my life, and that that plan does not include a constant battle with depression. There's two major lies for those who, there's two major lies of depression. And the first major lie I want to look at is, quote, I'm alone. Unquote. I'm alone. Um, just by just just a, just a simple uh, show of hands, how many of us have battled at one time or another depression in in your life? That's almost everybody here. Um, and the fact of the matter is, it happens. It happens. It, 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 it's something we all deal with. And it, it, it de definitely, certainly, I think it happens more. It could happen more in the in the life of a person who doesn't know Jesus as their Savior. But I also believe it also happens. It also even happens to those that that know Christ, and that have a close walk. That at times have had a close walk with God. The tendency is there. You know, we 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 as we live in the Spirit, sometimes we we uh, we get we get a fleshly desire and things start to snowball or a circumstance comes up and all of a sudden now we find ourselves depressed and not in a state of uh, enjoying the joy of our salvation but rather in a, in a downtrodden state. Here are some here's some thoughts regarding the feeling of, the feeling one could possess of being alone or I'm alone. If you know Christ is your Savior, you're never alone. As the song goes, no, never alone, no, never alone. He promised never to leave me, never to leave me alone. You know that song? Yep, that's, it's that, that's the truth. If you know Christ is your Savior, you're not alone. You have the Holy Spirit living in, you, living in you. You have the ability at any time to go to God and say, God, even though there is nobody physically next to me, I know you're there. Help me to realize that you're there. Show me from your word promises that you are here. I want to go to uh, 1 Corinthians 10. That's where I had you open your uh, scriptures this morning. And while this verse isn't as much dealing with the fact of being alone, it's the fact that uh, let's read the verse. Uh, verse 13. Um, the Bible says, There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, 
but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. What Paul is saying here is that whatever a person goes through, it's not different from any other situation that anybody else has gone through. The exact, the exact to the minute circumstances may not be the same, but for the most part, who here by a show of hands has never has never had a temptation? Okay, <laughs> that one's pretty obvious. There, everybody here at some point has been tempted at one time in their life, and there or, or another. So, but while the exact details may be different from one person to the next. The fact remains that temptations in life are common between one person and another. But note the promise Paul is going to give to these Corinthian believers. God is faithful. He's not going to throw a temptation at us that is way over our heads. But he is going to allow us to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ, as he, as he says to Timothy in another scripture, but that with the temptation, he's going to make a way to escape that we are able to bear it. We're able to bear the fact, you may be lonely, you may not have a, a companion in your life. You may not have that many close friends. You may have the feeling of being alone. But the fact of the matter is, if you know Christ as your Savior, you're never alone. Even if you're the only one in a room. Remember when he told Elijah, who thought he was all alone, that he had 7,000 men who had not bowed the knee to Baal? Elijah was not alone. Sure, Elijah might have been the only one in that spot at that time, and that's why he thought he might have been alone. But there were 7,000 <laughs> other men who had not bowed the knee to Baal. That means, if, even if we're alone in our situation... There are others who have been in that situation. We are not alone. Now, I also want to note that even John the Baptist had a struggle with being alone. And if you would turn with me to Matthew chapter 11, we'll take a look at this passage. Matthew 11. I want to read verses 2 through 4. What was the verse in Corinthians? Uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, okay. sir. Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 4. Here the Bible says, Now when John, that's of course John the Baptist, had heard in the prison the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said unto him, Art thou he that should come, or do we look for another? Wait a second. I'm, I'm not going to stop right there before we continue on. John the Baptist is saying this? Was not this the guy that said, he who has come after me is preferred before me. Is not John the Baptist the one that says, Behold the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world? Is this not John the Baptist who said, He must increase, but I must decrease? Whoa! Hang on a second here. Jesus answered and said unto them, Go and show John again those things which ye do hear and see. Verse 5. The, the blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And blessed is he whosoever shall not be offended in me. We'll stop there. Even John the Baptist, a faithful forerunner to the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ struggled in a moment that he knew he was going to die. His ministry was over. He was in jail. He was going to be put to death. Even he struggled with that thought of being alone and questioned what he had done. 
not in a complete depression, he was a little down. He was a little down. The circumstances had gotten to him, and he realized, I'm alone. But if, he knew, but if you know Christ as your Savior, you're never alone. And if we see that even if John the Baptist struggled with this, we're going to struggle with this from, t from time to time. It's going to happen. Now, we also, but we, also, so we also see in this that God has a plan for our life. We also want to see that Peter struggled a little bit with this. He went back to fishing. John chapter 21. John chapter 21. Peter, who was very loyal to his master for the most part, fulfilled Christ's prophecy in that he would deny him three, that he would deny his Lord three times. After he did that, he realized what he had done, went out, wept bitterly. Uh, fast forward to after Christ went to the cross, died, was buried, rose again. Verse 1 for context, John 12 to 21. The Bible says, and after, after these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter. <clears throat> and Thomas called Didymus, and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee, and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. They say unto him, We also go with thee. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Peter one of the most beloved disciples thought everything was all over. Even after Christ had arisen. He thought it was over. You know, life goes back to normal. I've got to make a living. I've got to make some money. I've got to make some money. I've got to provide for myself and my house. I'm going back to fishing. He felt down about the situation. Perhaps he still felt down because of what he had done to Christ, even though Christ, I'm sure by this point, had, for, had Christ had forgiven him, he, as, as he will go on to say later on in this chapter. We, even after God's forgiven us of all we've done, to go back a fishing, That was a sign of depression. Peter was down. But God was going to use him. And God would use Peter in a great way. Just a few <laughs> chapters later in the book of Acts, we see that great sermon at Pentecost which he preached. And we saw the salvation of 3,000 souls. The two major lies of depression. The first major lie is that I'm alone. We are in John chapter 20. Actually, we're going to be in Romans 15. We're going to be in Romans 15. You can turn, you can turn there right now, Romans 15. We're not going to, I'm not going to read that passage for a minute yet. Uh, we're in a Bible, we're just starting our Bible study on aspects of depression and how God can overcome, help us to overcome that in our lives. Go ahead there. I've heard some, some preaching and teaching suggesting that if someone's really living for God and serving them, there's no way in the world they can ever be struggling with depression. Some may make that argument. That's a good. Uh, that's a good point. That um, I'm not. Like, I'm not saying that that's my viewpoint, but I've heard people say it. Um, and certainly, if you're and certainly if you're living for God, I'll get to your uh, thought in a second. Certainly, if you're living for God, the the, the temptation is going to be farther away. <laughs> that if you know if you're out out and out serving God and having victory after victory in your life and giving God all the glory, it's certainly going to be further away. But, I mean, look at all the guys who have had victories in their lives. You think after winning thousands of souls to Christ that great men would never would never fall, and yet they have? Yeah. I'm not going to bring up names at this particular point. 
I can think of one example of that. Actually, uh, yeah, I, 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 I would picture out in San Diego he, he, when he took the church over. He was actually struggled with this for years before the church really, before God really started giving increase there. Yeah, certainly, certainly, you know, the circumstances that could come into a believer's life that can all of a sudden one day, one day or one month they're having great victory, multitudes are coming to Christ. The next two weeks they're down, discouraged, don't want to preach, don't want to do anything. They just want to sit and mope. Certainly that can happen. I, I personally, it's, ha it's happened in my life. I can, I can give testimony that, you know, this, this has happened where one week, you know, everything's going great. You know, I'm winning, I'm winning people, you know, I win people to Christ. Next week, I just don't want to be bothered. I don't want to go to church. I don't want to do anything for God. Uh, you were going to bring up a point? Brother Charlie? Um, well, just a few things that kind of triggered in my mind. Um, first off, uh, yeah, all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And so, um, ultimately, the thing is, I, I can't tell for everybody because I don't know. Some people are going to be, I guess, what we would perceive as blessed and actually, you know, genuinely be blessed. And maybe have it seem like they're always on mountaintop whereas other people are not going to have that same experience here but they'll still be in God's will having that peace and that confidence and then but the thing is their external circumstances are going to be such that it's, it's going to be a lot of conflict a lot of pain a lot of suffering and, and things like that even Apostle Paul himself like if we read through Acts uh, a number of the instances that we see and it would, you, I mean, some would argue, okay, was he really in the will of God? But the fact was he was doing what God had called him to do, uh, greatly used, greatly empowered by the Spirit of God. And uh, you see instances where he gets fed up. Uh, if you read in Second Corinthians in particular, looking back at some of the instances in Acts, he speaks of the fact that he um, was scared. Uh, where they were mistreated and then he he was comforted by the arrival of a certain partner in his group Titus or Timothy and such yeah. and so the thing is it's like wait a minute okay so you know on your human level you say you know all we see is just okay what was recorded but and then he would explain within Corinthians and a few other passages as well that okay yeah I was I, I feel disquieted I was not, I was basically in, you know, I'm depressed, or I was down, and so the thing is not, some, some people might, but others, um, in other words, no, no one's free and clear of it, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't, the, the path of the justice as a shining light that shineth more, into the day star rise, <coughs> um, so God's always got hope and good, you know, plan there's better days coming, yes. but that doesn't mean that you might not, you know, deal with something that won't be harsh, or ever encounter something that will be, okay, wanting you to, uh, I guess it's just how we respond. It's always, I think it's always going to be how we respond, you know, how, how we're going to respond when things in our lives aren't going as we had thought, you know, and certainly what God had knew was what God knew was going to happen and what was planning what we were what we are think what think is going on could be two very different things but the but at the end we're always going to see you know that God has better things that God will indeed have better things for us we'll be getting to that in a second the second lie of depression is that quote there is no hope unquote um, and I've had you turn to Romans 15, 4, but I've neglected to turn there myself. So if you will allow me the second to get there myself. <clears throat> Verse 4. Uh, here Paul says to the church at Rome, uh, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, for were written for our learning, that we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have <coughs> hope. Here's a question. What do you mean by hope? Define hope for me. Expectation. Expectation. Anybody else want to comment on what they think hope is? 
firm confidence in what will happen. I'm sorry? A firm confidence in what will happen here. Firm confidence in what will happen yeah, and expectation. I'm hoping the Bible is not just saying, like, I hope something good happens. It's you, you know it's going to. You have a hope in Christ. You know. It's not, I hope I'm going to be saved. It's you know you are. Yeah, there's some, there's some, there's some, there are some aspects of, uh, of religion that teaches, that teaches you have to hope to be saved. Yeah. Whereas, whereas we know from the scriptures, where Paul says that through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope, there is a hope because of the scriptures, because of what Jesus has done for us. We can have that hope. We can have that certain expectation. We can have that, uh, that confidence <coughs> in that God's going to work things out. There are better things to look forward to for those in Christ. Um, I think Charlie alluded to this passage earlier, so let's turn there. Uh, Proverbs chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 4. And I'd like to read verses 4 to 18. Here, Solomon is going to contrast two different paths. He's going to contrast the path of the wicked and the path of the just. And we'll see here a precious promise in the word of God. As, as a result of this contrast. Solomon says in verse 14, Enter not into the path of the wicked, and go not in the way of evil men. Avoid it, pass not by it, turn from it, and pass away. For they sleep not, except they have done mischief, and their sleep is taken away, unless they cause some to fall. For they eat the bread of wickedness, and drink the wine of violence. Verse 18, But the path of the just is as the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Basically, his argument there is that in contrast to the darkness, the way of the wicked, which is a, way, which is a dark way that leads to destruction, in, dark, in stark contrast to it, the believer's path is illuminated by the shining light of God's word and, of course, the light of the world. That would be the Lord Jesus Christ. As opposed, so there is better things to look forward to, the, the shining light that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. Is it a perfect day outside? Well, it certainly is beautiful. I mean, we only have great, it seems like most of the year we only have great weather here in South Florida. But was it perfect in September? Nah, not really. But the fact of the matter is, one day it will be perfect, because we'll be in heaven with a perfect Savior, with perfect glorified bodies, and we will be perfectly enjoying His presence and worshiping Him for all eternity. But until then, what we endure, while the world may endure other things, what we endure in light of what God has done for us, and what he went through on the cross is light affliction. Turn with me to 2 Corinthians 4. Go back into the New Testament. Go to 2 Corinthians 4. We'll take a look at verse number uh, 17. Uh, the Bible says, uh, verse 16 for context, uh, for, our, for which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but, a, but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. <laughs> While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I also want to note, you don't have the turn there, but I'm also going to note Romans 8.18, a pretty similar passage where Paul states, For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. These are great promises of hope that no matter what we're going through now, it's going to get better For if you know Christ is your Savior. It's going to get better. You may even think, maybe even in your darkest moment, you are going to have, there's going to be at some point, 
this life's going to end, the next life's going to begin. All eternity with God in heaven. You had a comment? Oh, I was just going to say, and, and Paul was addressing that the people that were really suffering a lot. That's true. You know, uh, Paul, Paul was not writing the people who were rich and well-to-do and had nothing going on. No, these were poor people. These were believers that were really struggling in their walk. And if he's saying that to believers who are really struggling in their walk with God, how much more can we take from these passages, from these hope, from the hope that God has given us? Because we know him. Because we, live, because we want to live for him. Because we don't want to be in a depressed state. We want, to know the jo we want to enjoy the joy of our salvation. We want to go on and we want to walk with God. We want to do right. We don't want to be depressed. We don't want to be in that state of woe is me. We want to be, and so even though what we endure is light affliction compared to what countless others have suffered, we have a hope. Depressed thinking actually slanders the character of God. It's saying God is not good. It's saying, well, God may be good to you, but God is not good to me. Depressed thinking slanders the character of God. Are you going to choose to be victorious by his grace? Or are you going to choose defeat? God's expectation is that we are hopeful. That we will show hope. Because of Jesus, because of what he did, he gives us hope. He gives us that comfort. If we walk with him in close fellowship, we can have hope. It's not something that goes away. While at times it may seem like it goes away, we can always come right back to the scripture. We can always go to him in prayer and say, help me, Lord, I'm struggling here for just a second. You know, help me, help me find hope in, in, in your word. Then go into his word and find those promises again. Find Romans 8.18. Find 2 Corinthians 4.17. Find passages like that. Find Romans 15.4. And see that there is hope. There is no hope. It's nothing but a lie. It's nothing but a deception. It's nothing but a tool in Satan's bag. If we think elsewise that we that, that there's no, there's no hope, we we can we gotta reject. We need to reject that notion. <coughs> we can have victory over depression. We can overcome overcome these these negative these negative effects. We can overcome these lies with the Word of God by walking close with Him by keeping short accounts of sin. We need to repent, reject that notion, and adopt the hope that he gives. Turn me to Hebrews, thir um, uh, Hebrews 13, no, I'm sorry, Hebrews 11. This is actually a pretty fascinating passage. I want to view a couple of different examples here. <coughs> I want to contrast two groups of people and see that there's going to be a little common bond between these two different groups. Uh, the first example I want to uh, look up would be uh, Abraham and Sarah. Uh, verse 13, where I know we're breaking into the context, the context would be that uh, Abraham and Sarah um, believe, believe God in spite of you know, not being able to bear a child for years. Verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the promises but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. Note verse 16. But now they desire a better country. 
that is in the heavenly. Wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. There's a different place. They, even though they didn't see God's promise to them directly, Abraham was told that he was going to have offspring that were innumerable. Did he see that at the end of his life? No. What, just a, he had just a handful of he had a handful of children. He had um, Ishmael and Isaac, obviously, and then he had so he had several children with uh, with another with Keturah. But even after that, how many how many did he have? Maybe maybe a small handful. Yeah. How many would he? But note all the descendants that would come after him: Isaac, Esau, Jacob. So on down the road. All those descendants, innumerable. He didn't see that, a pro that promise when he passed away. Now he sees that promise. I want to contrast this with verses 36 through 40 of the same chapter. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn asunder. Were tempted. Were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. And these all, referring to everybody in this chapter and probably numerous other ones, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise, God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. These all in, in the Hall of Faith chapter of Hebrews 11, they died having not received the promise. They died in different ways. It was Abraham and Sarah pretty much had peaceful had a peaceful end of their life here on earth. The ones in verses 36, 37 did not. Cruel trial of cruel mockings and scourgings. Stoned. Sawn asunder. Wandering about in sheepskins and goatskins. But the world was not worthy of these people. And we are not worthy to know and read about these people. But yet we have hope. We have the hope of, of the Lord returning. We have the hope of being able to live victorious and know Jesus and live for him and do great things for him. We have the promises. We have the promises right here, right in the word of God. A book full of promises. And then, not only we need to adopt the hope he gives, we need to be ready to give an answer of the hope that is with us. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm going to begin reading verse 13. And who is he that will harm you if ye be followers of that which is good? But in if ye suffer for righteousness' sake, happy are ye, and be not afraid of their terror, neither be troubled. Note verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. 16. Having a good conscience that whereas they speak evil of you as of evildoers, they may be ashamed that falsely accuse your good conversation in Christ. Having, not suffering with depression, not dealing with depression, being able to easily, being able to overcome it with the word of God, that allows us to give an answer of the hope that is with us. That conversation with that person down the street, if you're in a depressed state, you're not going to want to talk to anybody. 
You're just going to go on moping, woe is me. You're just going to walk down, ignore that person. You're, just gonna, you're not going to want to talk to anybody. You just want to go home and lie in your bed. Perhaps maybe get that pint of ice cream and just, just sit there and just mope. But we don't need to do that. We have a hope. We have a blessed hope. We're not alone. We have hope. God has a plan for your life, Christian. God has a plan for my life. God backs up what he says. And we know God cannot lie. At some level, depression can turn into sin. It becomes an affliction of your mind. The last passage I want to turn to this morning is James chapter 1. James chapter 1, I want us to note this and leave off of this this morning as we uh, go, as we've started our series on how to deal with, uh, how, how to identify depression and how to overcome it through the Word of God. Next week we'll be starting to look at examples of people who have struggled with depression in their lives. James chapter 1, here the Bible says, beginning in verse number 14, but, uh, sorry, verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth he any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Note this promise. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. What a great promise from God to close on this morning. Every good gift and perfect gift cometh from above, cometh down from the Father of lights, in whom with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. He is not a God that changes. He is an eternal being. And he has given us a reason to hope. Taking the right actions in your life to go into his word and seeing hope, seeing all the promises of hope, to believers past can all be applied to your life. If you know Christ your Savior this morning, you're not alone. You have hope. Find it. Go into God's Word. And then get and and you'll find the way out of the depressed state and into a state of God's going to do something great. Does anybody have any questions this morning? Nope. All right. Next week we'll look at um, the, one of the first examples of, of um, believers in the scripture, people in the scripture who have uh, struggled with depression. I believe we're going to start with Saul. But let's, uh, let's close with prayer this morning. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the opportunity we had to look into your word. Lord, I'm just thankful that we have your word. We have a blessed hope. And that hope is not with anything we've done, Lord, but what you've done for us. Not only in saving us from an eternity without you, but Lord, showing, giving us your word giving us the great examples of those who live by faith, those who had a hope, whether they were alone or not. And that, Lord, help us to overcome the lies of depression. Help us to, to battle by your grace and with your help and with your spirit that, 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 uh, that, come, that is inside every believer. Help us to overcome these lies Help us to rebuke them. Help us to realize 
that you don't want us to be in a depressed state, that you have a plan for our lives, and that you want us to execute it by your grace and with your help. Lord, I just pray you'll help all of us to execute what you would have for our lives. Help us to be said, help us to be said of us, well done, thou good and faithful servant. We love you. We do pray for the service to come, that you would be honored and glorified in what is taught from your word, and you would challenge all of us with, by your word. We thank you for what you will do. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good time, fellowship. We'll begin in about 10 minutes.